Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey, everybody, I'd like to welcome you to this week's podcast episode. I really, really loved this interview uh, that I did with Paul uh, Hadfield today. It was super interesting. Um, Paul has a long track record in the industry and just shared a lot of tips about selling value over price. Uh, obviously a hot topic in the industry and it was super interesting from somebody that's on the front lines, um, selling merchants as well as managing teams. I uh, really enjoyed that. So I think you're going to love this interview. Then in questions from the field, um, I talk about what is a great sales manager in the merchant services industry? What separates a great sales manager from an underperforming uh, or average sales manager? And so if you're in a management position, this is something where I talk about two keys that I think you're really going to enjoy and get some value from. So without anything else, let's dive into this episode. All right, everybody. I am here today with Paul Hadfield. Paul is a longtime industry veteran. How are you doing today, Paul? Doing great, James. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So I'm really excited about this uh, conversation today because we're going to be talking about selling on price versus selling on value uh, and what's really working in 2020. And obviously, this is a, a really big topic that is very hotly debated in the industry right now. So before we dive into all that, though, Paul, I'd love to get your backstory. So I know you've been in the industry for a long time. Tell us about how you found this crazy industry and then how you ended up doing what you're doing today. Uh, yeah. And actually, James, before I dive in, um, i not only do I appreciate being on your show, but uh, I love what you're doing for the payments industry. There's not a lot of guys that have the, the level of passion that you do about the industry and that have been around in the industry as long as, as I have. So yeah, uh, yeah thanks fun. for giving back to the industry. You know, there's for the long time listeners and industry people that know what a, a trans 330 is, right? Like those, yes. if you know what a trans 330 is, you're in a special club. So, right. uh, so when I first got involved in the industry. I actually, um, I went to, to college for about a semester and um, realized that I didn't need a degree to make money. I, I learned quickly that I could just be good at sales. And I dabbled in a couple of different sales roles until I stumbled into the payments industry. It was really small ISO um, that was really just getting their feet wet. And, and I jumped in and started learning the business with them. So um, that, I, I really haven't looked back since that was about 18 years ago. And, um, I've, I've started and, and, uh, exited a couple of different ISOs. And I think, you know, my experience in the, the payments industry really goes back to what it originally was, which was selling on price, right? That's, that's the main thing that we want to talk about today. And how I was taught how to acquire clients in the merchant service space was to have the best price and right good customer service. Right. The funny thing is here we are 18 years later in a 2020 world and there's a lot of people that still operate that way. And, and look, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. Right. Um, but we'll definitely dive into that a little bit more, but my, my career has really shifted from that, right. Being the best service provider, low cost provider to now being an expert. And right. Right. I acquire clients now, and because I'm an expert in the space, people trust me to know that, um, you know, here, here's the way that I look at it. If I can help a business grow by five or 10% be right. through technology, saving a small margin on basis points and knocking off some decimal, decimal dust, as I like to say, <laughs> becomes nearly irrelevant. So, right. um, so I, I've really seen the industry grow back from those trans 330 days to now moving into the cloud where your payment system can really be the central nervous system of your entire business. It right. can run everything that you do. And I implore every merchant level salesperson, every ISO, everybody involved in the industry to become familiar with how fast technology has moved and to realize that you don't have to be a commodity anymore. I mean, payment processors right. truly are a commodity. Everybody right. does it. Right. Um, it's, it's, you know, businesses are so much more savvy now than they used to be. They know that everybody does payment processing. They generally know that being a direct processor, a wholesale provider and all these things that we used to say, right. we have the internet now. Right. Merchants are savvy. <laughs> right. uh, they can cross check everything that you're saying. You know, we, we can't go out and, uh, lease a Verifone terminal for 48 months for hundred dollars a month anymore. They can look that up online. Right. So right. with so many ways to cross check people and, and cross check companies and 
provide validity in what you're saying and what you're selling. Right. The only thing that sets one person apart from the next is their experience and their expertise yeah. and their technology. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting about what you said there, Paul, is like so many things fired off my head when you were talking through your experience, because it's like, you know, when I get into the industry, uh, you know, which was uh, about 11 years ago, I was also, you know, pitching on price, no doubt, uh, selling leases, right? Um, and, you know, but one thing that happened to me really early on is the reason I actually liked the industry and the reason I, I'm so passionate about it has nothing to do with credit card processing, you know, I mean, which is like the most boring thing ever, let's face it, you know, the thing that I'm really passionate about is business. So even back when it wasn't about selling integrated payments, the reason clients bought from me still wasn't price. The thing I really pitched from the beginning was my, the relationship with me. Sure. You know, yep. I'm QuickBooks certified. I know everything about marketing. I can tell you, but you know, so that was my niche. And so I think as you pointed out, there's nothing inherently wrong with selling on price. Price is a form of value, but it's only one form of value. So it's like, you're going into battle and it's like, I've got my pocket knife. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. But the other guy has a grenade launcher. Right. So that's bad. So yep. you know what I mean? Right. And so isn't it like there's this value. So talk to us about, you know, how did, how has like selling merchant services changed? Like how did you approach it? You know, 18, 17, 16 years ago, how do you approach it now in terms of like that interaction with the merchant to like reposition yourself, not just as I'm this credit card processing person, but I'm actually an expert. Yeah. So, uh, and, and by the way, to your point, I think that the, the relationship that you have with your customers is still as important today as it ever was. For sure, for sure. Uh, the way that I generally look at it now is it's almost like to, to acquire a new client, think of it like a, like, a, like a sandwich, right? You have the relationship on the top and they're gonna start engaging with you in a potential sale if you have built some sort of a relationship, which again, by the way, now that's a lot harder to come by. It takes right. a lot longer now to build a relationship with your potential prospect because they just have more choices and more options. Right. Once you have earned your seat at that prospecting table, you have to have that level of rapport and trust and expertise. Like I was saying, in order for them to consider your technology. And I think the technology piece is right in the middle, right? You have to show that your technology, and in some cases, some people are still focusing on price. And again, that's fine. And if that's working for you, more power to you, but that's really what your, you know, what is your value that you're bringing to the table, your technology, your price, how are you helping their business? If both of those line up, then it's really, in my opinion, the relationship that ends up closing the sale. Right. Absolutely. You get in the door with the relationship, you're going to close your business based on the relationship. And what's in the middle is really the value that you're bringing to the table. So for me, what I found my first ISO that I ran for about nine years, um, once we hit that seven, eight, nine year mark, the attrition that I saw was, was um, immense. And for two reasons, one, we didn't have a vertical focus. We were focusing on anybody and everybody. Right. And number two, we generally sold on price. So what I learned the hard way, seven, eight, nine years into that business is that having a low price and close relationships can easily get trumped by technology. Yeah. And, um, going through that experience was extremely impactful to me. And I have shaped, you know, really reshifted my payments career around, um, you know, not necessarily even having the lowest price. I win plenty of deals today and I've trained many, many people that win many deals, leaving price completely out of the equation. Right. And basically saying like, look, leave price until the very end. Right. This is our price. We don't have to compare numbers to numbers. Right. This is what we charge to process your payments. The reason that you're working with us is because of everything we've been talking about. It's today. just part of the investment in order to get the return. Right. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I, I love so much stuff that you're saying. I mean, it's, it's so, it's so interesting. And I think, you know, one thing I want to get your opinion on that I think is really not talked about at all in the industry. I don't know why there seems to be this mentality in the industry that you either have to sell on price or value which right off the bat is kind of stupid because obviously price is value. So it's actually just different forms. Right. But the other thing that's so crazy to me is the, the mentality of the industry is if you don't, if you sell them on price, you're screwed. Well, wait a second. Why can't you sell them on price, get the sale and then come back a month later and sell them a POS system. 
you know, like nobody does that. I don't really understand why. Like for me, once I got to the point, you know, five years ago, six years ago, where it was like, okay, wow, it's all about POS systems now. Yeah. Um, I would go in and I actually established a ton of relationships because I was good at selling on price. That's what I did. And I had the whole relationship thing going. But like you mentioned, the, I had the relationship sandwich, but yeah. what was in the middle was price. Like that's how I sold. Yep. And I was very good at statement analysis and all that. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm just going to keep doing that. And then I would set the stage. Hey, you know, I build long-term relationships. I can help your business. I set up an appointment 30 days later. How's everything going? Are you happy? Great. I want to demo some POS systems, you know? And I sold almost everybody because yeah. they all knew me. They liked me. They were already doing business with me. So you I'm going to really Yeah, what are your thoughts on that On that kind of approach? Because that's just nobody I love that. Use that. I love that. And, and um, I, I still do that today for the right businesses. Right. Um, because if you, if you come in with an initial offer that is a, a big investment right. and maybe more high risk or what's perceived as high risk in your prospect's mind, you can always take a step back and say, let's start our relationship this way and, right. and go back in. Right. I love that. Um, and that's been successful for me as well. I think the problem that I, I've seen is a lot of people never go back. And yeah. the main right. reason is because selling, selling point of sale is difficult. Yes, very time consuming especially to large businesses, yes. Um, especially to businesses that are, um, think of a full service restaurant, yeah. which I work with a lot of full service restaurants. You're talking about front of house, back of house, multiple terminals, very specific ways things need to be set up. Yep. And I think a lot of people are turned off about that process. Right. Like what's going to happen after I sell it? And yeah, it takes a lot of work to understand what goes on behind the scenes. And Truthfully, most of us just don't want to learn. The easiest thing yeah. to do is the easy sale. Right. Right. And the easy sale, unfortunately, is not going to make for a long-term customer. Right. You're not giving them what they need to better their business. Yeah. You're, you're selling what you need to, to better your business. Right. It's right. a recipe for disaster. So yeah. um, there's a lot of ways to go about doing this. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that are watching this or listening to this that have that know in their gut, I need to learn point right. of sale, right? To be relevant in today's retail brick and mortar environment. I need to learn point of sale because right. I'm losing my business to competitors that are focused on point of sale and they know that, right. um, but they haven't done anything about it. Yeah. My advice to them would be to find a company that will support them and take care of them and teach them what yeah. to do. So they're not starting from scratch. Yeah. You know, I started from scratch and I learned the hard way. Yeah, same which here. Gave me the knowledge that I have today. Right. But now I'm passionate about helping others break into that industry and build a portfolio. That's somebody's not going to leave. If, if a competitor is saving $50 a month, they're going to say, you know what, I've got this guy that, yeah, it's a competitive price. The service is great, but the technology that they provide and the way that they support me, right? we have a relationship for life. And I think it's always a, a shock to an agent. I know for me, like, you know, seven years ago, and I started this, getting these shocking phone calls and these shocking interactions with my clients where it was like, in my mind, we had this really close relationship, you know? I talked to them very regularly. They loved the service. Yes. And I would get this like perfunctory call. Hey, James, we actually implemented a new point of sale system. So we're gonna have to cancel our account. I'm sorry, I integrated with them. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Like, you, this is my, and it's like, I don't matter at all now. I'm the yep. payment processing guy. They're talking about, and, and they would even say stuff to me like, well, no, you don't understand. Like, this is about our point of sale system. Like, yeah. like right. what you're doing is meaningless compared to this. Yeah. Or James, even worse, you don't get the call and you see on your residual report a zero. Yeah, exactly. Or, or you see like a fraction of the monthly volume and everybody right. that's listening that knows that feeling is getting goosebumps because there's right. nothing. You're like that guy. I talked to him a month ago. Right. And it's always your biggest account. Always. Yep. And yep. right there is that very moment where everyone thinks, man, I, I, I undersold I this it. guy. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Let's, let's, let me kind of formalize the question we've kind of been beating around the bush about here. And that is, you know, why is this transition so hard? So there are like, you know, thousands of people that are going to listen to this and, you know, 80% of them or 70% of them are like, yeah, I get what you're saying, Paul. I have this feeling in my gut. I'm selling on price. I know I need to sell technology. ISO execs and managers are saying the exact same thing. We know we need to transition our team to selling on technology instead of price. 
but why doesn't anybody do it? Or, or why do so many people struggle to make this transition in, in your opinion? Because it's hard. Yeah. yeah. That's it. It's, <laughs> it's a very difficult transition to make. It is a complete shift in how you've done it in the past. Right. It, it's a shift in how you sell. Um, it's an, a shift in what you know. It's a shift in how you support your customers. The sales process may move from one to two meetings to three to four. Right. And the crazy thing is, is the way that the industry is, is your, your profit margins may not change. They may go up a little bit because you don't have to compete on price as much, but you're investing so much more in that relationship up front right. to make roughly the same amount of returns, maybe a little bit higher. But what you're right. getting on the back end is a much more meaningful and longer term relationship. Lifetime value. In that relationship, you're more involved. Yeah. Uh, there's more support. So I think what a lot of people look at is, where do I start? Um, right. What system I, am I going to work with? Right. And, and how am I going to, you know, maybe I can sell it, but then what? How am I going to set this business up for success? Implementation, training, ongoing support afterwards. There's a lot of things that need to be carved out along the way. So I think for all of those reasons, people have said, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to hold on to this old model yep. and I'm going to ride this out because it's still kind of working. I see the writing on the wall, but I'm just going to put the blinders on. I'm going to hold my breath, cross my, my fingers right. that I can, I can make it. But like Blockbuster said the same thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Netflix is never going to work. <laughs> um, so, so by me, the way, Netflix tried to buy Blockbuster. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Blockbuster said no. Or was oh, it the other way around? Anyway. Yeah. The, there was a deal that was on the that, table. That panned out. Yes, exactly. So, all right. So let, I want to get dig into the details a little bit more. I love your answer here, but I want to dig in because I want to talk first about ISOs. Okay. So, you know, let's talk about an ISO. I've got, you know, let's say I have, you know, a hundred reps or 200 reps. They're out selling, you know, isn't one of the reasons, or at least what I see in my consulting practice a lot, the reason the shift is so hard is because these ISOs are so used to, you know, the, the 1099 agent goes out and does everything. They make the sale, they write up the deal, they maybe even install the terminal or they help with that process or they just ship the terminal out and it's not a big deal. Whereas, do you see this where the ISO now has to play a different role in terms of whether it's, you know, educating the, the agents in a way they never had before or installing? Like, what are, what are you seeing as kind of these keys for the ISO that has a team of reps? How do they make this transition specifically for them, you know? That's a great question. Uh, and I do think it starts at the ISO level. Uh, I think an ISO needs to find the right technology that sure. they want to attach themselves to, which is something that is going to meet the needs of every potential brick and mortar business, right? right. Cloud-based, feature-rich, um, processor agnostic. And right. then once they find that technology, they need to implement a, a, a training implementation and support system for their agents so that their agents can see, all right, selling point of sale is a lot more work, but I have an ISO that's here to support me. Right. Um, more so than an ISO that just says, hey, if you want to sell point of sale, here's our paperwork and, and, our, and our wholesale prices. Right. Go to and, our portal, you'll find pictures of everything we offer. <laughs> and the 800 number and, and here's what you need. Right. No one's going to sell it. And right. I've seen that time and time again. So oh, it, I see it. I, I literally see it every day. It's an, it's crazy how many ISOs where I'm like, hey, what uh, what POS systems do you offer? Oh, we offer Point, Clover, Mint, you know, Zusa, and it's like they give me like eight, and I'm like, wow, you offer that many? How many did you sell last month? Exactly. Uh, three. You know, and you're like, really? Like you sold 400 deals last month. You sold three POS. You know, like literally, it's that bad. And yes. I'm like, okay, why don't you cut those eight POS systems down to two? and actually learn them, have somebody in your organization train people and start actually selling them would be great, you know? I've seen ISOs that have had, they thought that their value was being able to sell everything. Right. And any product that you could possibly think of down to ATMs and prepaid phone cards they had in their, right. you know, in their offering. And that's exactly what would happen is salespeople got confused and they didn't sell anything. Right. They just sold the same old thing. Yep. Um, but taking this full circle, what, the, the agents want today is they need the support. They need the structure. They need the product and the ISO and a process that's carved out for them that mm -hmm. they can plug themselves into. And I think that's the best way to get most agents to adapt to what's happening in the, in the marketplace, which is right. number one moving pieces technology right now. Right. Okay. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit then and let's talk about, okay, you know, I'm an individual agent. 
And unfortunately, you know, I sell for three or four ISOs and none of them are taking this really seriously as we just described, you know. So I have a lot of things available. I can sell whatever I want, but it's not like I have all this training. What do you, what would you say to that agent? I mean, is it, is it to the point where it's like, you just have to find another company or would you say, okay, maybe you do learn it the hard way, pick a couple POS systems and move forward. Do you have any tips or, or, or thoughts for the individual agent facing that problem? Yeah, I think there's a couple ways you can go about it. I think um, the first way to go about it is to uh, become a, a practitioner in point of sale yourself and to figure out, okay, how much do I want to take on of this process? I want to start selling point of sale right. um, and I want to start selling it to bigger merchants that have a lot of moving parts and, and you know, start you know, playing in the big leagues in that sense. How much do I want to take on myself? Do I want to build my own implementation team, support team? Um, do I want to have that responsibility? Um, and if you have an ISO that is doing what we talked about before, which is, hey, you have these tools, go out and, and do what you will with them. Right. You have to make that decision for yourself. Um, yeah. Is that something that you want to learn? And generally what's going to happen is new sales are going to dip because you're going to be spending a lot of time really shifting gears and tweaking things and changing yeah. things from your uh, your go to market strategy to your support strategy. It's again, less sales, um, right. but it, longer term relationships. So yeah. um, if somebody wants full control over that process and they want to learn it and be involved in more than just the sale, because trust me, I know from experience, once you start selling point of sale and you're doing it on your own, you're much more than just a salesperson. Right. Um, so that's number one. Number two, if you don't want that, you're going to have to find a new ISO and on a new relationship that has a company that has the process in place. They've got the puzzle pieces worked out. They've sure. got the structure, they've got the support. And you know that you can still, for the most part, do the sale. Granted, it's much more consultative than it was right. before. It's going to right. take longer than it was before, but you have a partner that once you flip that account over, right. they're in good hands. You know, I will say too, I mean, one other option that we, we haven't really talked about. I mean, there really are some good ISVs now that are developing processor agnostic solutions that are including this support and even installation. Um, a couple that come to mind that I've just talked to in the last few days, uh, Mint, uh, M-Y-N-T, uh, and then Zusa. Um, you know, those are two solutions I'm thinking of just again, just because I talked in the last couple of days. There's a million more if I didn't mention you, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, there are solutions now where they're recognizing that this problem exists and they're making really good training and phone support and installation services available to the agents. So they're going out to the ISOs and saying, hey, you can offer our POS system. And since you really don't want to mess with it, you know, we will train your agents how to sell our stuff. Um, and so I think it's also a, a really big potential white space or area where, you know, ISVs can really step in. And they, you know, because the, the ISOs realize this problem. It's not like they're unaware. You know, they know that they offer eight POS systems and aren't selling any of them, you know. So I think it's a huge selling point to go out and say, hey, if you, if, you know, for an ISV to say, if you resell our POS system, we have training for your agents, we will um, do the installations, we have, you know, a support line for sales, right? Like, are you seeing some of that as well, where you're seeing some ISVs starting to kind of move in that direction? I think so, but, but not as fast as they should be. Yeah, yeah I agree. Like, definitely. Um, I, I, that's just where the market is moving. And I think, you know, the, the, Examples that you're providing, they're in the minority, for yeah. sure. Oh, for sure. For and, sure. But I can tell you that if you ask people that are moving in that direction, they're starting to pick up chunks and chunks of business away from these players that really haven't changed. And yep. you know, with, with um, previous companies, when we've entered into new markets and started getting into the brick and mortar space, in every single market, there's always that company or that guy or gal who is the person that's been there. Yes. Right? yes exactly. And you start to hear their name over right. and over again when you get in and you're like, man, this, this, this person's done a great job of building these relationships over right. time. It makes them harder to break into, but it's, it's just a matter of time. If that person is holding on by a good rate and they pick up the phone when that customer calls them, it's, it's just a matter of time. It yeah. really is. So again, those businesses that have not moved into technology and are doing all the things they should be doing, pricing and support along with that technology, or they haven't implemented that technology, the, the time is now, not even now, the time was years ago. So most people are playing catch up. Yeah, I agree. 
Okay, awesome. This is such good information. I'm sure we could talk about it for another hour here, but I got one other question I want to make sure we have time for. Um, tell us a little bit more specifically about what you do. I know you have some things going on, going on with Avi in the restaurant space, which is like, changed basically you know in the last three months completely flipped so tell us about some of the things that you're doing and some of the technology that you're working on now yep um so i i recently started uh working with a company called ov which uh some people on this call might know them as possible point of sale um the company took on some capital went through a rebrand and when i was introduced to the company um not only was I blown away by what they're doing, but more so the roadmap of where they're going. And the, from the 400 features to the nine languages that it works in and um, the way that they support their partners, which are some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, right. processor agnostic, everything under the sun. It's, it's one of the only systems that I've seen that is the best combination of supporting partners and allowing merchants to excel. Right. Um, so um, OV is on a path to, in my opinion, be one of the leading players in the cloud-based point of sale space. Um, and I'm working with them very closely to grow their direct and channel sales teams um, awesome. over, over the coming years. So uh, yeah, I, and look, brick and mortar right now is a, is a tough space in, in a 2020 world with everything going on. And once everybody shakes out of this, they're going to need partners that they can rely on. Every right. moving part of their business needs to succeed for this comeback to happen, which everybody's hoping for. Right. And again, I always say the point of sale is a central nervous system of that business. That yeah. central nervous system needs to be firing on all cylinders and connecting every moving part to make sure that they're successful. Right. So that's what I'm working on with OVA. And OV is, uh, is it restaurant specific? I thought, I, I remember saying something about that or just focused restaurant, on restaurant. Restaurant, retail, and, and grocery. Almost, almost oh, okay. every brick and mortar. There's, there's cool. applications across the board. Awesome. So just to clarify, OV is uh, processor agnostic. So this is something that if ISOs are looking for, as we just discussed, actually, if they're looking right. for a point of sale provider that is going to provide more of that support uh, for, you know, channel support or an individual agent that's looking to sell, a, uh, you know, a system, um, OV is an option for them. Is that right? 100%. Yep. Okay. And awesome. even down to not only is it processor agnostic, it comes in multiple colors. There's co-branding and white label options. So supporting agents right. and ISOs is the number one mission of the company beyond supporting their own merchants. Of course. Uh, great. Well, I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, are going to be thinking, hey, let me check this out. Uh, so where would you send them to learn more about the opportunity? Yeah, you can learn more about OV at um, OVHQ.com, O-V-V-I-H-Q.com. Uh, okay. If you want to connect with me directly, uh, my personal site is paulhadfield.co. And you can fill out a contact form and reach out to me or connect with me on social media. Awesome. And I really, really would encourage everybody to go check out uh, Paul's website. He's got some good info over there as well. So it's, again, it's Paul and then H-A-D-F-I-E-L-D dot C-O, right? You got it, bud. Awesome. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Great info. I really appreciate you taking the time to share it. Of course, man. And look, like I said at the beginning, there's only so many people you can chat with payments about, right? So anytime you want to nerd out about it, just give me a call. Definitely. Hey, sounds good, Paul. Thanks so much, man. Have a Thank great you. day. And now, here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. Hey, everybody. In today's Questions from the Field, I want to talk to you about a great question that I got from a sales manager in the industry. And that question is, what does a great sales manager do that sets that individual apart from the average or below performing, um, you know, sales manager? And thought, wow, what a great question. And I wanted to cover it today in questions from the field. So, you know, great sales managers, I think there's a lot of misperceptions about what a great sales manager is and what they really do that helps their team to perform. And today, I just really want to talk about two keys to a great sales manager. The first thing a great sales manager does is a great sales manager is an ambassador for the sales team within the organization. And so the sales manager has to walk that fine line of certainly keeping great relationships with the people that are inside of the organization. But at the same time, that sales manager has to go to bat for their sales team. And so when things come up and, you know, new policies and procedures come down the line that the sales manager instinctively knows 
this is going to slow down my sales team. This is going to hurt our production. They're going to voice up. They're going to say something. They're going to express their concern. They're going to have a conversation about, is this really something we want to implement with the sales team? You know, I'm seeing that this could potentially hurt productivity and they're going to be going to bat for the sales team within the organization and great leaders at the top levels will allow their sales managers that latitude to go to bat for the salespeople and to be their ambassador. But number two, a great sales manager is engaged in an ongoing conversation with each salesperson individually about goals and action steps. Let me say that again. Great sales managers are engaged in an ongoing conversation with each of their salespeople individually about goals and action steps. A great sales manager knows what motivates one salesperson that maybe doesn't motivate a different salesperson. A great sales manager knows what the financial objectives are for each of their salespeople. And then a great sales manager helps the salesperson to take those goals, those lofty ideas, those dreams, those aspirations. And, and the great sales manager helps that sales agent, that sales professional, break those goals down all the way down to daily action steps of prospecting and cold calling and whatever activity needs to happen in order to achieve that goal. That sales manager is helping the salesperson understand, you know, what those are and is able to break that down. And then they're able to have this ongoing dialogue and conversation where it's the middle of the week and they said, Hey, I know we had a conversation last week where to hit your goal, you needed to make 20 cold calls a day. And I see you're averaging 15. You know, I just wanted to check in with you to see, have you decided that that goal is unrealistic that you set? Or are you still trying to achieve the goal, but we just need to increase activity? They're having that conversation. And the conversation is not predicated on gotcha, or, you know, I, I want to make your life miserable, and I want to just push and push and push and push. No, the, the, the intent is important. The intent matters. And the intent with the great salesperson is always the same. I want you to achieve your version of success. And we've talked about it. And we've talked about the action that's necessary to get you to that level where you achieve the success that you want to achieve for yourself. Not the success I want you to achieve, the success that you want to achieve for yourself. And so I notice that your actions are not mapping to your objectives. So I want to help you. And so the conversation is, how can I help you, right? You're missing the mark on these things that you've set. How can I help? Now, if you, you say, well, wait a second, James, what if I'm a sales manager and the goals that my salespeople are setting for themselves is below my minimum expectation? Fire them and get real salespeople, okay? Real sales professionals are always gonna set goals higher than they should. <laughs> They're always gonna set goals that are just, frankly, unrealistic. And you're usually gonna have to help them come back down to earth a little bit. I know you wanna sell 40 merchants a month, but let's talk about what that would mean in terms of activity. And are you really willing to work 80 hours a week spending 60 hours prospecting? No? Okay, then maybe 20 a month is more realistic. So the, the sales manager that has hired the right people is having these conversations of, let's bring this down to a, a, you know, a level that makes sense. And, and then they're helping them to understand that. And so to me, that's what a great sales manager is. Hopefully, if you have a sales team, this will be a help to you. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of greensheet.com and ccsalespro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.